banks, there's this narrative that wholesaling is predatory. It's, mm. they call it equity theft, right? And we hear these stories of grandma getting kicked out of her house and this stuff just gets a lot of attention. And so the, the regulators, the real estate commissions, the National Association of Realtors, the media, everybody kind of grabs onto this idea around wholesaling being a bad thing. And mm -hmm. if you think about wholesaling, it's like the last frontier of entrepreneurship with a low barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. Think about it, a, a single piece of paper, an assignment of contract, a single piece of paper, you can make millions of dollars. Hey everybody, welcome to today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. We got a real special one for you guys today. We've got Jerry Norton coming in from Puerto Rico to talk about the latest and what is going on in the real estate market and also how to get all the motivated seller leads you want for free. Uh, it's a pretty ridiculous program when I heard <laughs> about it. I thought it was outrageous. Uh, so guys, you, you know I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on the show alone is enough to help you become a millionaire. If you'll take consistent action, you'll become one. And if you guys get value today, please hit that subscribe button. That way we can help more people become millionaires. You ready? Let's do it. All right. So the first thing is, you know, we've been talking about for some time how winter is coming, mm. right? Like wholesaling, the regulators aren't particularly fond of it. National Association of Realtors doesn't really love it. Mm -hmm. And some change is going to be coming eventually, and we got to be ready for it. Well, winter's here. Yeah, it's not coming. It's here. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know. So the snowstorm's like upon us, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, I've cited you when we talked about on part in this rush is like, you know, Jerry Norris has been talking about this for some time now. Mm -hmm. If we don't regulate from within, we will be regulated externally. Yeah. Yeah. So what is going on right now? Well, I mean, that's the question. The the real concern is in the marketplace, there's this narrative that wholesaling is predatory. Mm -hmm. It's we they call it equity theft. Right. And we hear these stories of grandma getting kicked out of her house and this stuff just gets a lot of attention. And so the, the regulators, the real estate commissions, the National Association of Realtors, the media, everybody kind of grabs onto this idea around wholesaling being a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Now, within our industry, we're, we're isolated. We're like in a bubble. We think we're amazing. We think we help sellers. We think we're the greatest thing ever. We think the entire real estate life cycle would not happen without wholesalers. All of that may be true. But that's not how the world sees us. Yeah, no, not at all. It's, uh, I kind of use this example for sales, right? We do, I, I'm very passionate about sales. Like, yeah, inside of sales, like we say, this is a noble profession. Yeah. The world needs us, right? Nothing happens <laughs> if sales aren't happening. But outside of our bubble, right? The nurses are at the top. The nurses always win as far as trust, <laughs> always win, right? But we're always like, as salespeople, hanging out with like attorneys and politicians. And it's just not <laughs> a good yeah. situation. And you talk about like, yeah, the value we bring, like, Whole, uh, realtors are seen as a higher uh, prestige. Flippers are seen at a higher prestige, right? Loan officers, title companies. But none of these people will be, uh, not none, but they'd be a lot less relevant if we don't have the wholesaler involved to find the properties. And you know what, Steve? I didn't realize how much the wholesaler plays a role in the entire you know, investing cog. I was talking to the National Association of Private Lenders, okay? And they're this big group. They've got a ton of private lenders. And they heard me talking about regulation and they went back and they surveyed their, all their members, lenders, mm -hmm. and they asked their lenders, okay, of the loans you do, where did those loans originate? So they're doing loans to flippers and stuff, right? It was like 70 some percent of the lenders that are doing private money loans to flippers were sourced from wholesalers. Really? I mean, that's a huge number to it's think about. Massive. Like the inventory that's brought to the investing world coming from wholesalers, I think it's way more than people even realize. So they're sourcing the properties and then they're referring the lenders to the flippers. Yeah, so the lenders are financing the flippers who are getting deals from wholesalers. Gotcha, gotcha. So it was the properties, point. Yeah, okay, so flippers aren't buying off the MLS, they're buying off of wholesalers. And you know what, when I started 20 years ago, the whole, wholesaling was like this obscure thing, it was like an underground thing, it was a little known strategy. And flippers at that point in time, like they'd source their own deals. They'd work with agents, they'd go direct to seller, they'd find their own. Well, since wholesaling became like this entire industry, they're all lazy. They don't <laughs> want to go set up their own acquisitions, right? right. They just want to rehab and do their thing and, mm -hmm. and buy and hold people want a landlord. So wholesalers have just kind of filled in that outsourced acquisitions team really is all right. wholesaling is. It's outsourced acquisitions. Yeah. You look at the history. Um, when you get into 
investing, right? Like you watch HDTV. Yeah. Right. You just buy this deal. He knows how it came. Right. Just buy this deal and get all the glory. <laughs> um, but there was a time way before all these different data providers, uh, the flippers would find the homeowners directly, buy the property, rehab it, and then sell it. Yeah. Like they did the whole spectrum. Yeah. And then at some point, someone realized, hey, I can get someone to bird dog it. I'll just pay mm -hmm. them 500 bucks. Right. And then eventually the bird dogger became the wholesaler. Mm -hmm. And now they're collecting a fee. But the other thing too is um, I remember we learned this in real estate school. It's, it's funny enough. Wholesaling, we didn't call it wholesaling, we call it a, a, a signing yeah. or, or optioning. Mm -hmm. Was that I wouldn't pay you, if you're the flipper, you wouldn't pay me my 15,000, 20,000 assignment fee on the HUD. You pay me 500 to 5,000 cash to sell you the contract. Yeah. Right. It was outside of title, it wasn't through escrow. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly when it went from like cash outside mm -hmm. of escrow to on the HUD upon closing. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of laughed like we got our dear friend Jamil and he figured out to create this whole other thing where like, I'm going to connect the wholesaler with the flipper. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So we created another little yeah. compartment in it. Um, but yeah, wholesalers, we think we're valuable and we, we kind of like initiate this whole uh, ecosystem. Yeah. But we are not revered. No, no. In <laughs> fact, um, wh here's what's kind of scary about it is I don't know if it's salvageable. That's the scary thing. The name's pretty tarnished. I don't know if we can save save wholesaling, meaning change the perception. I think we've we've lost that window's co come and gone. We've waited too long mm -hmm. to really do anything about it. Nowhere are we actually creating some other kind of image for ourselves. No. So what's happening is. The bad actors, which every industry has them, right? Mm -hmm. Every single industry has them. The bad actors are getting the spotlight. They're they're getting the local news Massive stories. Spotlights. And like, it's so national news. And it's so easy. You just take the one bad thing where somebody got ripped off and thrown out. And it's and, and if it's an old person, that's even more helpful mm -hmm. to the narrative. Mm -hmm. And then they run with these stories. And then you've got you've got consumer protection, all the regulators, everybody. I mean, you look at we're gonna talk about it, but you look at South Carolina. I did not know this, maybe you knew this, but nine out of the 10 members of the commission, the real estate commission are licensed agents. Mm -hmm. There's nine agents and one lawyer yeah. that make up the South Carolina and real I estate commission. And I think they had the rule where one of them had to be not be licensed or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if anybody's seeing a problem here, mm -hmm. but that's the overarching problem here is we're demonized in the media and in all these places mm -hmm. outside of our own industry, we're demonized. Right. And when you're made the bad guy, it becomes really easy and justifiable to pass regulation. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is I don't think it's just gonna stop at, hey, we wanna regulate you, we wanna organize, we, we, we wanna license you, we wanna watch what you're doing. I don't think that's the end game. Yeah, we, you talk about a tarnished brand, like I think we're lumped in there with the ambulance chasers. And, yeah. And you can't revamp that ambulance chasing narrative. I don't know how you change that perception in the marketplace. Yeah. So, and I get it every day. I get DMs about how shady we are and how wrong we are and how bad we do to people. And it's just misunderstanding. Well, you know, I tried, when I first started real estate disruptors, I tried to marry the realtor world and the wholesaler world. Yeah. I tried. Yeah. I, and I tried, I want to say for quite some time, maybe 15, 20 episodes, and I realized we're just mixing oil and water here. They're just destined to hate each other. It's, it's, it's the Montagues <laughs> and the Juliets or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's the house, you know, whatever the two families with Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. This is just the way it's going to be. They're just going to hate each other. And so I've had multiple conversations with high quality, top producing realtors, explaining to them the value that a wholesaler provides. And after the ones that are open-minded, after a 10 minute conversation, they see the value. Yeah. But the perception at the beginning of the conversation is how you're just stealing someone's equity. And even worse, <laughs> stealing equity is you're taking away my opportunity to get a commission. Yeah. Well, part of the problem here too, is if you think about like who's attracted to a wholesale business and it's very entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. like as a wholesaler, you're, you're very much a business owner, very entrepreneurial. And the agent model is very much professional services. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a professional, I've been licensed. I, I go through continuing education. So it's a much different type of person that is drawn more towards, towards the real estate agent mm -hmm. model yeah. than it is maybe a wholesale business. And I mean, for those that, that don't know you, right? So like I asked you here to talk about for, for a, a couple of different reasons. We've known each other for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, so you're licensed. Mm -hmm. You flip. 
How long have you been licensed? Most business owners waste their time and money on solutions that never fix the root problems. They'll address all the symptoms due to slow revenue, and because they're only fixing the consequences, the real problem stays hidden and the cycle of wasting time and money continues. It's like having a lingering headache that won't go away despite trying every over-the-counter medicine. When in reality, you should have just gone to the doctor and had them figure out exactly what was causing the headache. And that's what's so difficult about business. You can see and feel the symptoms and yet struggle to find it. Now imagine you can find a prescription that doesn't just mask the symptoms, but actually addresses the root cause. Where would your business be if you address that right now? That's what our sales event is about. Your marketing doesn't suck, your leads aren't bad, and your operations aren't terrible. It's that you haven't addressed what actually makes you money in wholesale, which is the conversations you have with homeowners. It's critical that you build trust with sellers, demonstrate that you fully understand their situation, know exactly what's keeping them up at night, and paint the ideal outcome that leads them to a better future by working with you. That's what it takes to get signed contracts and keep your business going. Simply put, at our event, you'll walk away with the framework, phrases, questions, documents, and process to close more sales and buy more houses. Join the hundreds of others who have come to our live event and dramatically grown their business. Our event is happening soon and is available for you to join only if you're willing to take the pill. Almost 20 years. Yeah. When I got started in 04, that was the only source of data or information. I mean, if you didn't have a license, you did, you were up. There was there was the MLS and driving for dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did yeah. both those. Those were my options to get data, to get right. information. Yeah. It's way different than today. So license, eventually open your own brokerage. I got my own broker. I got my broker's license because what was happening is as a wholesaler, the broker would bring me in once a year and say, what are you doing? You're a liability. <laughs> you know, go sell some real estate. And I wasn't selling real estate. I just wanted the license for investing. Yeah. So I was changing brokerages every year. So I said, yeah. you know what? I'm just going to go get my own broker's license and not answer to anybody. Yeah. So the, again, the reason why I asked you to come in, because you have a unique perspective, right? Like there are a lot of realtors who look upon, look down upon the wholesaling industry. And wholesalers, you might not be aware of like how the perception is on the outside. Yeah. Having someone that has a real estate license been practicing the realtor side also the flipping side, you have a, a, a different uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just a quick aside as well, like I got my license in 07. Yeah. I went to real estate school. I went through the whole deal. We're at 90 hour credit hours, whatever it was. And I remember walking out that day as well as like the first 10 years of my realtor career. What, an, what a massive waste of time. <laughs> Everything we learned in real estate school. Massive oh, waste yeah. of time. How many square feet are in an acre and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, right. What a rod is and all these mm -hmm. other stuff. But once I became an investor, that information was actually useful. Yeah. Right? Learning about lot splits and uh, joint tenancy and- Oh, yeah. All different these ways different ways to take title. Different ways to kind of, like how to clean up title. Like mm -hmm. all these things you need to become a successful real yeah. estate. Not need, but it would be helpful. Yeah. It's funny. Like that, that didn't come I feel the same thing. I feel like my, my licensing education has just enhanced my investing ability and exactly. skill set and knowledge. Right. And you and I talked about this. I remember you came and, and we did some content around, you know, getting a license as an investor and just all of the benefit you get from that. Like the downside yeah. is so minuscule and the upside is so massive. Right. Well, let's, let's touch on the downside because you and I think that the downside is comical. Yeah. What's the downside of becoming a license? You have to investor? disclose that you're licensed. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. Right. You're held to a higher standard ethically don't have ethics. <laughs> you should be anyway holding yourself to a higher standard, you know? Yeah. So it's just, yeah. it, it, it's mind boggling. Like, oh, you don't be licensed. You're going to create greater liabilities. Like, no, don't be a bad person. Yeah. Whether you have a license or not, <laughs> do the right thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so then yeah. the upside though, what's the upside of being licensed? Well, I mean, there's so many upsides. Like you can set up your own showings. You can list your own properties. You can get referral. You can refer listings to other agents. You can only get paid from an agent on a referral if you're also licensed. Right. Like my license alone makes me hundreds of thousands of dollars just that alone. Right. Being able to receive commission and, and refer leads to other agents. You can get a property, a lead that doesn't work out, refer it to a realtor and get paid legally. And if the other side decides to kind of hose you, you have legal recourse. Yeah. Right. I think that's the biggest thing is like, hey, 
this deal doesn't work, I'll send it to you as a wholesaler, right? I'll send it to you as a realtor, you know, kind of hook me up mm -hmm. when something works out. I've got no legal recourse because this activity here was illegal. Yeah. You can't pay someone <laughs> a quote unquote, Un not referral fee, referral fee, not, right? It's called non-commissioned sales. You can't do it. Can't do it. But as a realtor, hey, Jerry, I'm going to send you this deal. And when it closes, pay me 25%. Yeah. And if you don't, we're having I'm, a conversation. I'm calling somebody. Yeah. We're having a conversation and we're going to have, we're going to work this out. We even, we even list properties where, you know, you spend money on a lead, you get a seller on the phone and they're retail and they're not a motivated seller. Yeah. We'll offer to list it for them. Yeah. You know, if you have your license, you can do that. Exactly. So tons of benefit, I think. Yeah. So winter's here. So what, what's going on right now in the market? Well, if you look at what's happened in the past five years, so Illinois was the first state to pass regulation, and, and it was pretty hard. Like, they came down really hard mm -hmm. on wholesaling. The fines, 25000 more than one in a 12-month period, is considered, uh, is considered brokering. Like, that's, there's two camps, really, Steve. There's the camp of if you market a contract for sale, that's brokering and you need a license. So some states have done that. That's Nebraska, that's Oklahoma, that's Kentucky. So their big concern is, Marketing a contract for sale is brokering, therefore you need a license. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody's like, okay, well, fine, then I won't uh, publicly market my contract. I'll send it to an email list or investor lift is, is privately owned. Well, mm -hmm. that's not the intent of that, and I don't think that will hold up. But that's mm -hmm. been the argument is, okay, that's easy to get around. Another camp is taking on the position that just the act of wholesaling, just the assignment of contract in and of itself is brokering and therefore needs a license. And that's Virginia, that's Illinois, that's now um, Oregon and Iowa. So a lot of states are taking on that mindset that it's not about marketing your contract, it's just doing it. We're considering that now brokering and mm -hmm. you need a license. Yeah, which I personally completely disagree with. Me too. But my legal opinion means absolutely nothing because <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. And I'm not prepared to go fight the state of Oregon. We're not going to have a train versus the state of Oregon to set some sort of precedent. Well, that's the thing is all of this is so new that it's going to take case law mm -hmm. to really define what some of these laws are. Because some right. of them are sort of ambiguous, ambiguous. A lot of people are like, well, I can double close. I've got some real, I've got some real different ideas around if you can double close in some mm -hmm. of these states, if that will actually be permissible. You know, so there's, there's these there's this prevailing movement in the real estate commissions. And you got to understand something here. The real estate commission, they only have jurisdiction over licensees. Mm -hmm. So I didn't quite understand this till recently talking to some lawyers that the big movement to get you licensed as a wholesaler is less about, um, we want you educated. It's less about that. They may say that that's what it's about. Like, hey, we want you educated and hold, held to a higher standard. It's more about falling under the jurisdiction of the commission because now they can mandate what you do. They can control what you do. They can update the way you do things, right? Like they're now, they're now watching you. Right. You have different jurisdiction. And, and just to kind of give like some, uh, a different perspective on this, you know, I had my brokerage at my peak. I had, you know, hundred plus realtors. And I remember at some point, I think when I was getting my broker's license, you had to take nine hours or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, whatever the broker says, is the way it is, yeah. <laughs> right? And I had a dispute with somebody, like an agent in my organization. And I said jokingly, like, I don't think you understand. Like, when you argue with me as your broker, like, what I say as your broker is the law. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, that sounds excessive. Like, I, I know I'm saying it jokingly, but per the Department of Real Estate, if you're yeah. licensed with me, what I say as a licensee is the law. Because the agent is a sub-agent of the broker. Right. The broker is ultimately held responsible. Exactly. So I would say this jokingly, but I also kind of meant it. And so a, a step above the broker is the Department of Real Estate. Mm -hmm. And what they say is also the law. Yeah. And they don't have to go through the legislature. They don't have to get the governor to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a department that's regulated by the governor. But at the end of the day, if they say this is the way you need to do things, it's the way you need to do things. Yeah. 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 And so, so we're seeing, all right, so you were saying like the intent here with the licensing. So mo most of the regulation is around licensing. There's, a, there's two states that didn't require licensing. Arizona, they just want you to disclose. Mm -hmm. And then a brand new one is, um, who was brand new? Was it Indiana? 
I think Wisconsin just did something. Oh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin just did uh, same thing as Arizona, where they just want you to disclose. But by and large, it's about getting a license. And now the newest thing is not just a license, but also heavy disclosure. Mm -hmm. And Oregon went so far also as to, as to follow Philadelphia, which is they want you to register now with the state. I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah, to register that you're a wholesaler. Yes. And you got to follow some rules. You got to pay fees. And you got to be 18. You have to, they can do a, a criminal background check, fingerprints. Mm -hmm. Like it's getting pretty controlling. And that's always been my biggest fear of the regulating with the with the background checks. And I understand it's someone's asset, but like part of me, I don't know why I've always had my heart out for the person that needs a second chance. Yeah. And my biggest thing with when we regulate this because we knew this day was coming. We we're hoping that it would, but we knew this day was coming. My biggest fear is always like if you're going to regulate this. And have background checks, then there are a lot of people that have turned their lives around that might be get regulated out of the business. Yeah. That's Oregon. Oregon, if you have a background, then you you're not allowed to register, you're not allowed to be a wholesaler. Yeah. And then no Jamil, second chances. And Jamil posted this video. It's like, okay, so you can basically sell fentanyl. Yeah. <laughs> Smoke crack. Yeah. Do heroin. <laughs> but God forbid you wholesale. Yeah. Right. Is it is it it's just yeah, it's really sad to see some of the, some of this going down, and and yet, at the same time, Steve, this is where like I have an issue with this. I have like a moral dilemma because everyone tends to want to like gloss this over, or maybe be like, okay, well, no problem, I'll just double close. Well, maybe, mm -hmm. but if you're not actually being fully aware of what's going on and you're not taking this head on, meaning open your eyes to what's happening, and then you're not going to be able to pivot in time. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing for me. I, I whatever they're doing. I need to know about it. I want to be ready for it. And if I see the bigger picture of what's happening, I just want to be able to pivot. And I want to help yeah. other people pivot. Right. Because we're all going to have to pivot here soon. Oh, yeah. You have to pivot. Like, not pivoting. I mean, I guess you could not pivot. You just got out of business. You're going to be obsolete. You're going to go out of business because yeah. the, the changes are coming, and they're coming faster and heavier. And South Carolina might change the entire game for the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't, you know, wake up, you could turn to Blockbuster. You're going to be blockbuster or, if you don't or wake Nokia, up. right? Yeah. yeah now like, we're we're innovative, right? So I'm just trying to be innovative. So I'm actually not discouraged by it all. I'm not like down about it. I'm actually just want to be aware and mm -hmm. I want to be able to see what's coming and be ready for it. Because when it happens, then I don't want to be like introducing a new model. I want to have a new model working well, which yeah, you, means I, I'm changing now. What you got to be doing. prepared today. That's right. Yeah. So there's not as many people talking about this. Yeah. Why? Well, I think most of the people that talk about anything related to wholesaling are is the education space, and the education space thrives on, you know, newbies coming in. And mm -hmm. if you think about wholesaling, it's like the last, it's like the last frontier of entrepreneurship with a low barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it: a, a single piece of paper, an assignment of contract, a single piece of paper, you can make millions of dollars with zero entry into the business and no money, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Where else in the world can you do that? Wholesaling is the last business model yeah. where a brand new person with no experience, no barrier to entry, no, no requirement whatsoever to get in, mm -hmm. can learn how to do it. And with a single piece of paper and no money, transact millions of dollars. Yeah. Well, that's not looked upon very highly, right? Like that's, <laughs> that, that door is going to get shut and it's, yeah. that's what we're seeing. Right. And so, so what it means is what it means where I'm going with that, Steve, is like, I think nobody wants to talk about it because it's kind of like, Oh, I don't want to. I don't want everyone to get discouraged. I don't want. I don't want new people coming in the business and not want to come in the business because now there's some friction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just. That's my perception. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, that's well, part of why I don't think people are talking about it very much. If that's a perspective, that's slightly irresponsible. Yeah, right? I have a moral dilemma with that. Yeah, what's your moral dilemma? Well, I don't want to be telling people, uh, "Hey, get into wholesaling. It's a great business." Which, by the way. It's not going to work out so good for you because there's they're stopping the newbie from getting into the business. Instead, I want to say, hey, here's what's happening. Happening, you can still get into this, but we've got to do things differently now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yeah. your barrier to entry is going to start to go up some here, but you can do it, and let's figure this out. Yeah, and so, I've got ideas around what what we need to do to figure it out. But so you started in '04, I started in '07, right? So we've got a chance to like You're like a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> we got to experience a few different things and the market shifts and the regulations that occurred. Yeah. And one of the ones that really pissed me off, probably the one that pissed me off the most, was the Dodd-Frank Act. Yeah. Right? And because the Dodd-Frank Act came out to protect homeowners from 
uh, these uh, people that are quote unquote uh, equity stripping and this mm-hmm. and that. And so we were doing short sales, right? Shout out to Matthew Potter. He's the host of Part in the Disruption. I would go out there and market myself as a short sale expert, but then he would do all the paperwork. Like he yeah. was the one that was on hold oh, with man. the banks. He had, the this bad, he had the worst job. He had the yeah. worst end, <laughs> but he didn't pay any marketing expenses. I took care of all the marketing, right? So, uh, but we did a lot of short sales. Mm-hmm. And when Dodd-Frank passed, the thing that passed in Dodd-Frank was that 21 days within foreclosure, they could not start a short sale because they considered that to be predatory. Mm-hmm. And so after that passed, we had so many homeowners, because like you know how it goes with denial. Yeah, I'm in foreclosure, I'm in denial, this is no big deal, this is no big deal. And then there's a window where they're like, crap, I'm in the bad spot, I need help. And it's the 11th hour. It's the 11th hour, <laughs> well past the 21 day window, and they reach out to us, and all we can say is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because of Dodd-Frank, I can't help you save your house. And they go to foreclosure. And they go to foreclosure. Yeah. Like, it was like, it was so painful. It was so mindless. As a professional, I'm frustrated because you're holding my hand, or you're, you're preventing me, you're holding my hands behind my back, preventing me from helping people. Yeah. And like, that's the thing that I thrive on. That's what fulfills me. So I can't do that. And now we got these regulations. Those are doing the same thing. Because if you think about it, let's say that they get rid of the assignment of contract and we double close. Right. Okay, well, when you double close, you introduce more fees, right? You got you to pay fees when you buy it, pay fees when you turn around and sell it, and you got to pay transactional funding. Where are those additional fees coming from? Not to mention potential transfer taxes, depending on other states. Some states have high transfer tax. So where yeah. that, that additional fee, those additional fees to double close, who's paying those? Homeowner. Not you're, the business owner. You gotta you, you gotta make a profit. It. Yeah, you gotta you're in business, right? So that gets passed on to the homeowner, the very yeah. person that is supposed to be protected. Yeah. So you and I are are still gonna have the same targeted profit, uh, same profit targets because we have the same marketing expenses. Our marketing expenses didn't go lower because of the new regulation, right? So our profit targets still the same. So the money is coming from somewhere. It's coming out of the homeowner's pocket. What we could pay went down because of these costs because yeah. because of these rules and regulations that are coming in place. Yeah. And if they stop wholesaling altogether, like let's just hypothetically say, and everyone's going to think this is like outrageous, but there's some things going on that very well, we could start to see this happen real soon. South Carolina's like right here. Mm-hmm. But let's just say that they did that. Let's just hypothetically say no more wholesaling. Like you can't do it. License or no license, you can't do it. Well, what's going to happen now? Well, I mean, the number one method to still acquire discounted properties is going to be to buy the property, like just actually close and buy it. The way it used to be. Before wholesaling before it became popular. Yeah. So now if I have to actually buy your property homeowner and I got to now introduce all kinds of fees because now I have to fund that purchase mm-hmm. because what's not going to change is people are going to buy properties and, and then there's a, you have people over here that want to sell at a discount and then you have people over here that want to buy. The middle there of acquisitions is always going to exist, mm-hmm. whether it's directly to the flipper or, or some, type of, some type of wholesalers in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Well, now you're introducing all those fees. And so that's, again, it's just going to push this. this gonna, it's going to come out of the seller's pocket. It comes out of the seller's pocket. The other thing, too, is, you know, I'm a, um, you know, shocker to people that are watching the show. I'm a free market capitalist. All right. Uh, and well, I did f- not know that. <laughs> and bring a free market capitalist. As irritating as it is to have a bunch of wholesalers in your market, right? We're in Phoenix. This is the guru yeah. capital of the world. It's also like all the, like real a wholesaler per capita. I got to imagine it's the highest here. We have a lot of competition here. Mm-hmm. Right. So as irritating as it is, I have a lot of competition, it still serves as a function to create demand and that we have to be our best to yeah. win the business with the regulation. You know, it's kind of like, uh, it's really hard to go and start like an oil company, right? I mean, Chevron, Mobile, all these other guys, they made it pretty hard. Start a bank right now, it's pretty hard. Like the bank we're a part of, it took them 17 years. Yeah. From when they started, so the bank was launched, right? It takes a lot of time and effort because of regulations. And with the regulation in place, you were saying a moment ago, like all the wholesalers that want to come in, they can't really get in anymore because the, the, the restrictions can be in place, making it easier for people like you and me to buy properties. And who doesn't win in that scenario? The homeowner. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, this is exactly what's happening with the NAR settlement right now, where, you know, it's predicted that a million licensed agents are going to leave the industry. Well, there's only 1.5, so what's going to happen to the other 500,000 that do figure it out? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're going to kill it. They're right. going to absolutely annihilate their business because you've, you've made the entry harder 
right? You made mm -hmm. the business model harder, right? So wholesaling is going to be the same thing. If, if, if the newbie can't come in today and get a contract and assign it with no money, and it's now left up to just the people with money and with capital, then the, the highly capitalized investors are going to be the ones that yeah. get so all the deals. It's a funny time in the real estate right now, right? So in the realtor world, the rich can get richer and the less adequate are going to be gone. And wholesaling and flipping, really, the rich can get richer and the less competent are going to be gone. Yeah. It's an interesting time. So I want to talk to you about equitable interest. Yeah. Um, it's a funny idea because this... You would think that equitable interest, since it sounds like a legal term, would be universal across all 50 states. Yeah, which is not. Yeah. But it's not. Mm -hmm. It really is state dependent. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about equitable interest, because I think that was a big part of the Oregon yeah. uh, change, what does equitable interest mean in general? And then what does it mean in Oregon? Yeah, so some states consider equitable interest if you've got some kind of tie to title, right? Like, you're, like a, a contract for deed. Mm -hmm. You're not actually on the deed till you pay it off, right? But you now have a legal interest in the property mm -hmm. by nature of that. Um, other states look at it like, well, just by nature of having a contract, anybody that's a contract holder has an equitable interest in that property because they, they hold a place in the contract. Mm -hmm. So a buyer would be an, have an equitable interest in that property by nature of his contract. Mm -hmm. So some states kind of look at it like, okay, well, wholesaling is basically marketing your equitable interest. Right. Other states, I think, are looking at it like, well, no, when we say equitable interest, we mean you have some type of legal tie, you're mm -hmm. on title in some way to the property. That mm -hmm. would be an equitable interest. Yeah. So it's sort of like a little bit of a debatable thing as to what's what when, right. it, when we talk about equitable interest. And it's, it's, you and I were talking about this the other day, and like as we were talking about it some more, I was thinking like, well, there's equitable ownership, which we'll talk about in, uh, in a moment. Yeah. Uh, but equitable interest, it feels like in order to really earn equitable interest is I actually have to give you money, right? There has to be consideration, right? Real estate can't transact without consideration, which is only $10, right? Yeah. That's the bare minimum. To create equitable interest. To create, uh, to, to offer consideration. Yeah. Right. Which is another legal term. But like, I don't, I can't buy your house for less than $10. Like that's like the minimum, right? That's the consideration. Mm -hmm. I have to, there has to be item of value. Um, how do you generate equitable interest? without actually giving up any kind of financial or some other consideration. Yeah, I mean, are they looking at earnest money as equitable interest? Is it? Because it's refundable. It's refundable. It's not, what if it's non-refundable? If it's non-refundable, then at that point, I think you can make that argument. So, I, And again, we're not lawyers here. It's yeah. just these are questions that I've been asking because these questions are, these things are coming up in, in, in all these states. Yeah, like if you look at Iowa, here's how Iowa, Iowa wrote it. They said... The definition of wholesaling is when you hold an equitable interest, but not legal title in a residential property for the purpose of selling the equitable interest to a buyer. Okay, now, to me, the way I, the, the way I read that to define is the equitable interest they're referring to is in, in holding a contract that you don't have legal title to that you're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to sell a property, by nature of having that equitable interest, but not legal title. So to me, the not legal title is kind of a key term there. And then, but then also this introduces, well, what about a double close? Mm -hmm. It brings, it throws that into the wind because technically a double close would be not legal title, mm -hmm. right? Because your BC contract, you don't have legal title yet. Right. You don't. So that's kind of a problem, isn't it? It is a problem. And as we were talking about this the other day, I was, I, I was, and that's the reason why like, I wanted you on the show. Like, I want to talk about all these things. Like, these are the kind of conversations that not everyone's having. No one's having these conversations. Right? Uh, particularly, you know, again, not to toot our own horns, but people with you know, brokers experience and like, <laughs> title experience and all these other things. I mean, I'm sure you've been subject to, to a handful of lawsuits. I've been in a lot of different lawsuits where we had to explain our positions in these, in these situations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have a property. I'm buying Jerry's house on 123 Main Street. Steve Trang and or assignee. I'm going to sell it to someone else on a double close. But I don't have ownership yet. Mm -hmm. I can close on it. I could do the double close so that when they close on it, I will have title. But in this language here, I can't even market it. Yes. Because I don't have title yet. That's correct. 
You spent countless weeks going back and forth with a homeowner only to lose a deal because the seller changed their mind, another wholesaler made an unreasonable offer, or what the seller needs from the sale, you just can't pay. Now imagine you've got the ultimate control on a property that you just locked up, meaning you're on title and every decision has to go through you, eliminating virtually every external threat. That's why the installment method was created. Through installment payments, you have full control of the property as your name is now on the title. Any decision the seller wants to make now has to be approved by you. No longer can they pull out equity, go with another buyer, or change their mind. Imagine combining the best of creative finance with the flexibility of marketing the property on the MLS to collect the most amount of revenue possible, all while having total control of the property. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The concept here is simple, but implementing is challenging. So visit wholesale2024.com to learn more so that you'll never have another deal blow up. So when I talk to, I've talked to a couple different lawyers. You and I know um, Gary mm -hmm. Picken in, in uh, South Carolina. I've talked to a lawyer in in um, Nebraska because their, their laws, that, that regulation's been there since 2022. So we have a couple years and, and what they're telling me, like the overarching thing is all of these strategies we do where you don't actually have legal title, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's novations, that's double closes, that's assignments. What we're doing is we're, we're finding a way to make money in a real estate transaction on a property I don't own yet. With, with not much skin in the game. With no skin in the game. Some non-refundable earnest money or $10 or whatever. <laughs> That's the problem, mm -hmm. and that's what they're trying to close. Mm -hmm. what, what, what they're, they're, they're defining that as wholesaling. Now, we, we have our own ways of thinking, well, it's an ovation. It's not wholesaling. What they're doing is they're <laughs> defining wholesaling as any of these things where you have an equitable interest by nature of a contract mm -hmm. that you're trying to sell where you don't have legal title yet. Right. So a common strategy, I mean, we have some rock stars that came on the show in the last year that are just absolutely crushing it. With attorney in facts, right? Where they're listing it, it's like a novation, but it's not a novation. Okay. But they're listing it on the MLS, right? You sign attorney in facts. Would you kind of put that in that same category as well? If you don't have legal title, yeah. Yeah. That would fall under that category. Yeah. And look at how South Carolina worded theirs. So, so South Carolina said, having a contractual interest in purchasing residential real estate. So just that alone, like a contractual interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, that's any of these things we're doing, a contractual interest mm -hmm. in a property. So it says having a contractual interest in purchasing residential real estate from a property owner, then marketing the property for sale to a different buyer prior to taking legal ownership of the property. Yeah. That's their definition of wholesaling. That right there, that's all the things we do. Yeah. And it's, it's a... Uh... It's almost like they have someone on the inside figuring this out. <laughs> they may. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so like the one that passed in Arizona, it's like 2047, whatever, HB 2047, I think yeah. is what it was. You know, like when that went down, before it passed, um, I, I saw it because it was, uh, uh, someone sent me a text message like, hey, what's this bill? And I was like, I don't know. Let me look at it. I read it. It's like, I know the guy that wrote this bill. <laughs> and I'm reading this. And I sent him a text message like, hey, um, this language here, no teeth, no teeth. You're not protecting, <laughs> you're not protecting anybody on this deal. No. Right. And he's like, well, how would you write it? I was like, I'm not, I'm not telling you, <laughs> I am not going to be the one that's going to like, how do you like regulate wholesale? Steve Tramer, like, <laughs> you'd have a bullet, you'd have a target on your back. Yeah, yeah. You I go. wouldn't really say this. Right. I am not going to be the one to tell you how to write this contract or write the, the, the new laws, uh, in the state of Arizona. Yeah. How to <laughs> well, even Arizona and, and Indiana or, um, Wisconsin did the same thing, which was, it's so funny to me because. I get disclosing to a seller that you're a wholesaler, but they make you disclose to the cash buyer. That's hysterical. Yeah. So you have to, in, in, the, in Wisconsin now, same with Arizona, your assignment of contract has to disclose that you're a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an assignment of contract. How is that not, like, what is the, how does the cash buyer not know that? Well, there are some states, though, that assignment contract won't work for a double close. So you actually have to have, from what I've, from what my understanding. Yeah. An actual purchase contract. Yeah. An actual purchase selling agreement, not an assignment of contract. Yeah. So um, that's how a lot of states do that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's funny that you have to disclose that. So let's talk about then like other ways then to pivot. So I had um had Devin Robinson come on. Uh, uh I want to say back in November, maybe December. Right. And we're saying, okay, winter is coming. We need to pivot. 
right? And so here was our plan. I want to see, you know, what your thoughts on this, if, if, this, if you think this is a bad idea. So um, everything we just talked about here as far as equitable interest, right? Well, our, b- before, before you do, mm-hmm. can we talk about South Carolina and the second part of that bill? Yes. Because I think this is going to be great for what, for finding solutions. Because what South Carolina said is not only did they, did they define wholesaling as a contractual interest, your marketing before you own the property, which basically means all these, all these things we do, you need a license. Now, I thought I did a YouTube video on this and I thought they were complete morons, like what a bunch of idiots. Because the second part of the law says a real estate brokerage firm and its subagents are prohibited from engaging in, representing others in, or assisting others in the practice of wholesaling. So we, here's wholesaling. We want you to get a license. Oh, and by the way, if you're licensed, you cannot wholesale. Yeah. That's what South Carolina did. So if you want to wholesale, you have to get licensed. If you're licensed, you're not allowed to wholesale. I mean, if this passes, which it passed the Senate on the 4th of this month, mm-hmm. March 4th, it passed the mm-hmm. Senate, which means... It's got to pass the House and then signed by the governor, and that is law. That in South Carolina is stopping wholesaling. I mean, mm-hmm. does, do people realize what's happening right now? Like, South Carolina found a way, and, and so I asked uh, Gary Pickin about it. I'm mm-hmm. like, why? This is so dumb. He's like, no, it's not. It's genius. Mm-hmm. And it's so genius that the other states are probably going to follow suit. Mm-hmm. Because what they did is they brought, they brought wholesaling under the commission by, li- by requiring licensing, and then they said you can't do it if you're licensed. And that's what we were saying earlier. Like, Brokers, set whatever broker says the law, whatever the Department of Real Estate says is the law, and then you didn't put this as a law by itself because there's some constitutionality situations, right? If I want to wholesale you this phone, no one can get in my way, right? Hey, Jerry, I have access to this phone. I have it under contract for ten dollars. Would you like to buy it from me for twenty dollars? That's contract law. That's constitutional, right? You got the uh, was it commercial code mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But that's that's Baked in the yeah. constitutional law. From day one, yeah. Right. <laughs> but if I say, hey, like, in order for you to wholesale this phone, you need to be registered with some telecommunications uh, registry or uh, yeah. um, some sort of regulatory body, and then that regulatory body says you're not allowed to wholesale iPhones. They just did it. They, they just, just stopped it. it. They just stopped and it. And no, now there's no more question of constitutionality unless someone wants to fight that battle. And take it all the way to the Supreme Court and undo it, right? Which... Right. Who's got that kind of money? I mean, maybe that's what ends up happening at some point in time. But what South Carolina did is they brought it under their jurisdiction and then made it illegal to do it. Right. So what is going to happen now if this passes? What is going to happen in South Carolina? And this is so I'm looking at it like, okay, well, if I'm transacting to South Carolina, if I if I'm a wholesaler in South Carolina right now, I'm very concerned. Right. And this is virtual people that wholesale there. Mm -hmm. If you're local and active there in a backyard market. But it's not just South Carolina because you think you think everybody else is going to everyone else has been trying to figure this out and right. South Carolina figured it out. Well, I was I was on the phone with R.J. Bates about this. Uh, I want to say maybe two three months ago, and because he wholesales nationwide. Yeah. And um, they had a deal in South Carolina that they tried to wholesale and they posted it on InvestorLift. And his dispo rep got a cease and desist notice yep. delivered to his home in an apartment complex. So someone looked up who his disposition person was and served a cease and desist notice at their home, not at like RJ's office. Well, think how easy this is going to be. You just go on investor lift. You look at all the inventory that's on there. You look up who, who, who those people are and you send them. So the yeah. steps are a cease and desist. And then you, and then if you do it again, it's fines mm-hmm. and then it up to jail. Yeah. Like it's a big deal. It's not like you. It's not like you just like. Oh, I'll just pay a thousand dollar fine and right. keep doing my thing. Yeah, there's no there's no loopholes. Like I, it's worth it to me. Like for me, like driving the carpool lane, that's a loophole, right? Five hundred dollars every time <laughs> is worth it. <laughs> right, that's a loophole. Yeah. No, this is like serious consequences. This is a big deal. Everyone should be talking. This should be the talk of our industry. Is mm-hmm. what South Carolina is doing right now. Yeah. This well, is a big deal. Like I said, my intent after everything's said and done, this should be the you know our biggest episode. So. Um, so we got Devin Robinson, right? He's in North Carolina, okay. but he wholesales in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, right? And so what he had to do in South Carolina was he had to do an installment sale, right? Because he was doing, they were doing innovations, yeah, right? But this includes innovations. They couldn't do innovations anymore. So what he did was he got an agreement for sale 
where he was legally added to the title, right? So he's not on the deed, he's on the title. And with that, uh, and by being virtue of being on title, you have equitable ownership. Now you can control the transaction. Now you are operating as the owner, and now you have the right to market the property. Because you have legal ownership. You have legal ownership. So you can now resell. Yeah. So, I, so ideally, if I'm following the steps with this, you would meet a seller, you would have a, have a, a purchase agreement to an installment. Mm -hmm. So it'd be probably a specialized type of contract, right? right. Purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. You'd run title, make sure you know what's going on there. Close right. in seven or 10 days with mm -hmm. title, mm -hmm. with an installment, which could be a, in other states, it'd be a, a contract for deed, land contract, all Agreement the different things. Yeah. Yep. It's basically where the, where the, where it's held in escrow until you pay it off. Right. Now you turn around and go market it like you normally would. Exactly. Either MLS or however, you mm -hmm. find your buyer and now you resell it and yeah. you pay off that agreed amount right. from the, with the seller when you, when you resell. Right. And no one can say anything because you have legal- You have equitable ownership. You have equitable ownership. Yeah. That's the idea there. Right, so instead of having an equitable interest, you have equitable ownership. And like that was like, when these guys talked to me about like, you know, Devin's talking to me about, here's something we're doing. I was like, I like this because installment sales has been around since the 1800s. Mm -hmm. I had to do the research. It's been around since the 1800s. Uh, IRS publication 527 actually has a section on installment sales. Mm -hmm. It's like, I feel pretty good about that. And there's a lot of case law already that protects it. Yeah, case law. Because it's been around forever. In almost all 50 states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was, if you guys are, you know, wondering we're talking about wholesale2024.com, you check out the episode with Devin Robinson, we explain how they kind of came onto it. And I, I personally think this is the future. I was talking to Tom Kroll about this by September mm -hmm. uh, of, of last year. I was like, uh, this is probably going to be the next biggest thing. Yeah. Now, devil's advocate, you know, that's not super clean. Like there's definitely things that could go wrong there. You know, are you leaving the owner in the property? How are you getting them mm -hmm. out? You know, it's introducing some more steps, but so is innovation. Like innovation's got all kinds of moving parts. You I know? mean, so it's just the way we adapt, I guess. Right. Uh, if there's one thing we know for sure in real estate is that's chaotic. Uh, we had this deal. Um, we were going to film some content around it or we we're going to publish a video about it, but our server got hacked. So we lost all the footage. Uh, but we bought a property. Someone else bought the property after us. And this is a situation where the guy was on the run from the ATF. Like we bought, we, we signed the contract where it said, this contract is contingent upon the seller not going to prison. Like that's the actual language. And the team called me on a Sunday, like, how do we write this in a contract? <laughs> right, subject to, it's contingent on him not going to prison, right? Um, Why not? Why couldn't he go to prison? Oh, uh, well, he was hoping he could beat the case. Oh. He was on trial. So if he won, then he wouldn't have to sell. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm with you. So that, that was his intent. While facing trial, he got wind the ATF was coming, so he <laughs> left high tailed out of town. Yeah. So then it's been impossible to get a hold of this guy. So we finally get a hold of this guy. We find him in prison, right? Which is incredibly difficult to find a person in prison, <laughs> right? So we finally get him in, get a hold of him in prison. He's not on a list, you know, for yeah. that. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah, can't, you skip, can't trace that. Yeah. Cell twenty four. <laughs> uh, so we finally get a hold of the guy, and only to find out that while he was in prison, he's been talking to a girlfriend who signed the contract with another person who also owned a title company. They recorded over our memorandum, right? So like we were looking forward to going to town and winning this title suit, only to find out that the guy that bought it, the guy that owned the title company and wholesaled it, um, they burned the house down the day before close of escrow. So the property, who's, who, whose insurance is covering that? I would argue probably nobody, right? The buyer's insurance isn't gonna cover it. They didn't own it. Seller's insurance, he's in prison. He doesn't care, he got his money. Yeah. So this is whole mess, right? And everyone's yeah. like freaking out. The team's falling apart, and they're like, "Steve, why are you not stressed?" Yeah, I was like, "It's real estate." Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just this is another day, another day, another deal, right? It's just what we do. If we're innovative, I mean, if we're innovative, I mean, the thing is, is like the, the ultra successful investors that I know, everyone mm -hmm. I've ever known that's really successful, they 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 adapt quickly. Yeah, right. You're all, we're always adapting. You have to. You have to not just for market cycles. Like we have to adapt for that, but we're ingrained in this business, if you've been around very long, that what worked yesterday may not work today. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have the most amazing marketing channel that's killing it today. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow it doesn't work anymore right. for whatever reasons. And, and, you with, and you switch and you, and you adjust quickly. We saw that with texting, right? Yeah. Like direct oh, mail, yeah. direct mail was so effective and then texting came along and direct mail became grossly ineffective. Cause it was so much more expensive. Right. Yeah. And then texting has become less effective. Now what's, what's, what's really effective today? Do, yeah. Direct mail. We're gonna go, yeah, back to direct mail. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there's another way I'm looking at it too. And one of the things that I'm doing right now to pivot with all of this is um, 
just good old fashioned take it down, mm -hmm. take legal title, and resell it. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge with that is the capital mm -hmm. because now you need 60 day money. All right. right. It's not quite transactional funding because it's not same day, next day. It's not a rehab loan because I'm not fixing it up. I don't need the money for six months. Mm -hmm. I just need it to take it down, trash it out, clean it, new pictures, back on the market. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, if you do it right, you, you contract it so it moves quick and you resell it. And nobody has an issue with that whatsoever because all it is is we call it whole tailing. Like mm -hmm. that's a common name for it. Today. But, it wasn't when we started. Yeah, it wasn't called that. It was just called real estate investing, you know, <laughs> like buying and selling. Yeah. But it's literally, I mean, it's really open door. Isn't this open door? Yeah. That's all open door is. Mm -hmm. They're just institutional and they right. can do it. And But what do they do? They go in and they, they buy it 80 cents on the dollar. They sell it for retail value. And mm -hmm. that's all they're doing. Right. So for me, I'm like, how do I become a mini open door, right? How do I get capital and structure the capital so that I'm so that it's it's available, it's quick. I can sit down with a seller now and I can say to that seller, look, I'm the buyer. Mm -hmm. I can give you earnest money. I can show you proof of funds. I can waive contingencies. I'm a legit buyer. So now you can be very aggressive. You can have a real, you know, teeth in your contract. Wholesaling, we got to have all these contingencies and $10 earnest money because we don't know if we can find a buyer. Right. So we need a way to get out of that contract, right? Well, not if you're taking it down, not if you're the buyer. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking heavily going forward at like, okay, well, how do I hold tail now more? How do I get set up with capital? Because capital is the limiting factor. Yeah, I mean, at this point, right? Everything else get is sort of the same. Yeah. Like motivated sellers are motivated sellers. Like I, marketing and lead gen are the same. But now instead of trying to do some sort of a not own legal title type of deal, mm -hmm. how do I take legal title? Don't pre-market. Don't get a predetermined buyer. Yeah. Trash it out, resell it at that point. Yep. Yeah. Um, but maybe... I like the installment method. I mean, for me, I'm going to be really heavily because the install that idea there, Steve, it reintroduces a way for newbies to get back into the business. Right. Because now you don't need money. Right. Right. Other than maybe a thousand bucks or whatever to down payment to that seller. Yeah. But now what are you doing? You're somehow getting yourself into the legal title situation mm -hmm. and then reselling. Right. But you're on the hook. You're the owner, you have responsibilities, you have repercussions, there are consequences, right? And that goes back to skin in the game comment. You have skin in the game. Now, now, so there's things that can, that's, that's not really super clean, like, like doing an assignment is just mm -hmm. so clean. Yeah. But if, if it's what we have to work with, it's what we have to work with and we'll get better at it and we'll perfect it. Yeah. And then just going back to capitalization, you know, I think that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people are scared of, right? So what is your strategy? Now, obviously it's easy because you have a, brand, right? I mean, like, it's not hard to find Jerry Norton online. But what is someone who has never been asking for money? What are they doing here? I mean, you have to make raising capital front and center. And here's the thing about it is a lot of people are intimidated by raising capital. But really, the amount of capital you actually need to raise is very small. Because here's why. Institutional money is readily available for everybody right now today, whether you have experience or not, at 80 to 90% of the purchase, mm -hmm. right? So you can go to any hard money lender and they're gonna give you 80 to 90%. They want you to bring in that 10 to 20% mm -hmm. as skin in the game, down payment. Right. And they'll charge you 12% and two points. Like it's just, it's everywhere. Not in Arizona, but most okay. of the Okay, what are you paying? 14? Thousand bucks. Oh, cheaper. Thousand bucks, 10%. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so even cheaper. Even cheaper but the, the market rate is like 12% and two points. Two and 12 is pretty standard pretty across standard. the country. Yeah, yeah, around, I mean, like that's normal, some some higher. But but my point is, you don't have to raise any money to get 80%, let's just call it 80, 80% of the money. Well, okay, if I'm buying a deal for 100,000, 80,000 of that money is already sitting on the sidelines for you. Yeah. You just gotta go find lending home or whatever, whoever the lender is in town mm -hmm. that's doing institutional lending. Yeah. So what's the real issue? The real issue is the other 20,000. So that's where private money comes into play. Mm -hmm. But private money for 20,000 to be in a 60 day deal, to me is still easy to raise. Like you go to someone and you're like, hey, I'm gonna give you 12% on your money, a couple points, I need your 20 grand, I'll pay it back in 60 days. Mm -hmm. You're second position, so you're, you're, you're exposed a little here. But look, I'm buying this for 100, I'm gonna resell it for 150. And so that's where, for me, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be focusing heavily on raising capital, mostly private money and not that much of it because a couple hundred thousand dollars gets you in the game. Right. You're doing five deals a month with 100 grand. Yeah. If it's 20 grand, you know, under those numbers, it's 20 grand a pop. 
Use hard money for 80%, private money to make up the difference. Now you're in the game. Yeah. And um, it's not as complicated as everybody thinks. It's not. Uh, so where would you, if you were newer, recommend people go to find the private money for the 20K? My number one source of private money is IRA, self-directed IRA mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And where I go is I look at someone, anybody who's worked in corporate for 10 to 20 years mm -hmm. has anywhere from 25 to 100,000 in an IRA. Yeah. You show them how to self-direct it, super easy to do. Mm -hmm. They go to one of these self-directed custodians, takes a week to just move their IRA over, and now they can lend it to you on a deal. Gotcha. So Really easy. And here's what's even better about it. That money, I get at 8 10%, no points, and I defer it because if it's, if it's an IRA, if it's a self-directed IRA, the payments to that person have to go back into the IRA account. Mm -hmm. They don't get to touch it. Right. Because it's the IRA's money, not theirs. Now they mm -hmm. own the IRA. By doing those transactions, like making monthly payments, all you're doing is increasing administrative fees. You make it the harder IRA. for them. And it's just eating into their number. So I tell them, I say, look, we're going to defer the payments. And when I sell the property in 60 days, I'm going to pay back the principal, the accrued interest, and that all gets paid back on the payoff when we sell it, mm -hmm. protected by a lien. Right. And that's how I get most of my 10 to 20%, I call it secondary money, mm -hmm. and, and I'm in the game. Yeah, so self-directed IRAs. Is right. a, it, for me, is the number one. And that's the people that your, your kids play soccer with, that's your mm -hmm. neighbors, that's everybody around you. Most people have twenty-five dollars to $100,000 in a self -direct, in an IRA mm -hmm. that they can self-direct and lend you on real estate. So let's talk about some strategies. So you know, we just mentioned a moment ago how there's a big settlement with NAR. And Cobrokes are now, it's unresolved exactly how it's going to look, but it's not looking good. <laughs> right? For who? For realtors. Yeah. It's not buyers good for agents. Real. Yeah. Buyer agents particularly. Yeah. Right? So Jerry, sophisticated investor, sees this information and now is going to go hunting on the MLS. Oh, yeah. What's your strategy in hunting on MLS? And now? I'm going to have a massive advantage over everybody else because now if you follow what's happening is the buyer's agent commission is like up for grabs as far as like, okay, now I have to have a broker agreement, mm -hmm. a, a buyer broker agreement. That's one of the rules. Um, I'm going to have to negotiate my buyer's commission mm -hmm. or the buyer, or the, the buyer's agent's going to have to negotiate his commission and figure out who's paying it. Mm -hmm. So for me as an investor, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm, I'm excited about this because I'm going to be going to listing agents that have properties that I'm interested in offering on. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to that listing agent unrepresented. And I'm going to say, hey, I don't need to ask the seller to cover the buyer's agent. In fact, I don't even have a representation. I'll let you represent me. What's your number? Mm -hmm. 3%? Great. I'll pay the 3%. You know, we don't have to ask the seller. I'll pay it. And now that, now that listing agent is doing dual agency. Now this is where you're allowed to do dual agency. Mm -hmm. But now it's no longer like a given 3%. That's what we used to do. We called it the double dip, right? Mm -hmm. You'd let them have that 3%. They got both sides. Now it's like, well, not only, not only can we have a discussion about what you're going to charge me to be my buyer's agent representation mm -hmm. on, this, on your own listing, yeah. but we don't even have to ask the seller to pay it because I can pay it. Mm -hmm. Now I got to bake that number into the deal, obviously. Like it's, it's a cost now of that, but this is going to open the door for investors to create even stronger and more strategic relationships with listing agents. Yeah, because you can now bring the buyer's agency to that listing agent, and now it's up to you to negotiate whatever fees you want to pay mm -hmm. and charge. Yeah. So in this scenario, you got a homeowner. He's got two offers. Get one from Jerry. And you're not asking for concessions. Yep. You're not asking them to pay for commissions. You're not asking for contingencies or very bare minimal contingencies, mm -hmm. right? Just I just need a contractor or inspector to walk through. That's it. Yep. Very, very limited contingencies. And you got another buyer who might pay more, but wants you to pay for commissions, concessions, mm -hmm. uh, and all sorts of contingencies. Appraisal, yeah, financing. Financing contingencies which might last, which does last all the way to the close of escrow. Which will the homeowner go mm -hmm. with? The guaranteed cash offer that can close whenever he wants to close or this other one where he, yeah. it's even though the net will be higher, as a matter of principle, he's not going to want to pay the concessions and the commission. <laughs> like this, this is the way, the way human yeah. dynamics work. 
yeah, and he, he has to wait for. We've set up here now where investors can completely annihilate retail buyer competition. Yeah, it's really sad because uh, I had a conversation when, uh, on one of my coaching calls. Right, um, you know, fortunately, I get to coach a lot of people in in, in real estate and sales, and they're asking like, "Hey, like, in your opinion, who wins here?" It's like, mm -hmm. "We do." <laughs> the investor, <laughs> the investor wins. Right? Yeah. Buyer agent loses, listing agent, most of them will be gone, but the ones stick around are going to be rich. Uh, <laughs> homeowners are going to lose. Um, buyers are definitely losing. Yeah. And the investor wins. How is a retail buyer going to compete with investors? When they tough. have to ask the seller or figure out some way to get their buyer's agent paid. Not to mention, you know, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere, but like there are murmurs that the Department of Justice can get involved. Mm-hmm and say that they're going to make it because of this ruling that buyer agents cannot be paid by the sellers. Mm -hmm. And that means the buyer has to pay it. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, because buyers can barely qualify as it is and get into the, now they got to come up with a buyer's agent commission too. Yeah. I mean, like we think of expressions, right? Like, I don't know if you heard this one. Uh, drive till you can buy or drive till you can qualify. Which is just like, well, I can't afford it in Phoenix. Maybe I'll go out to Tempe. Can't afford mm. it here. Maybe I'll go to Mesa. Can't afford it here. Well, there's always Apache Junction, <laughs> right? Or I can't live in Chandler, so I'll go to Queen Creek. No, can't afford Queen Creek. I'm going to go to Santan Valley. Well, even Santan Valley is pretty tough. I'm going to go to Florence. Like, drive to you qualify was a problem mm -hmm. because people don't have as much liquid cash. Yeah. And so you're going to come in here. Again, Jerry's cash offer. Not contingent, no concessions, no commissions, and you're paying the realtor commission. And, and and I'm making I'm turning the listing agent also into a buyer's agent. So now they're highly incentivized right. to work with me. Now I'm not saying they're gonna be unethical, but come on, they're gonna make they're gonna make twice as much money. They're gonna be working little... with Jerry. They're gonna be calling Jerry on their next deal. Like it's how you create. I look at all of this, Steve, like every given day, somehow we have to create a competitive advantage mm -hmm. if you wanna be. If you want to be good at what you do, you have to find a way to stand out in the market. Yeah. That that dual agency double dip strategy is going to be the new way to stand out and really have a leg up over everybody else if yeah. you can. Yeah. So every time we do something to benefit other people or benefit general public, it, it does not work out in their favor. All right. So I want to talk about something else here. Um, I heard sometime from a couple of influencers that are pretty grumpy. <laughs> And they were saying, at well, me? well, not you, because <laughs> I didn't know it was you yet. <laughs> uh, they were pretty upset that their prop stream affiliate revenue was going down. Mm. And I was like, why is it going down? Mm. Like, well, there's this thing that's prop wire coming out, to which I follow up with, well, what's prop wire? <laughs> and like, there's this system for getting leads for free. Yeah. What's prop wire? So... I've come from a software background. Um, PropWire is not my first software. So I have a software called Flipster, and it's this great little software for wholesalers and flippers. It's a CRM and, you know, has deal analyzers and digital contracts and budget tracking, and all these cool tools. And I started it in 2014, so I've had it for a while. Um, you know, overseas development team. And there came a point uh, about two years ago now, I think, where I was like, I want to create a software, but I want it to be like not just this little niche software like I've got, but how do I now build like a world-class software that can really have massive impact? At the same time as that kind of thought process or that idea, one of the things that I'm really, really good at, one of my superpowers is, is email marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if most people may not know this, but I generate 20,000 opt-ins monthly from just free things I give away or tools or scripts or whatever. And so I build this massive email list. And, and my philosophy is anybody that's in the um, you know, education space or any type of info marketing product space, software, whatever, you think that your social media is like, you, it's yours, it's not yours. The platform owns those followers or subscribers. Right. You know, I have 500,000 subscribers on YouTube, but I'm not delusional that YouTube owns those, not me. Mm -hmm. I can't reach out to any one of them directly, right? No. And they could turn me off tomorrow and I'm done. Right. And we've seen that happen. Countless times. Right? So... My objective is to build a, a list of people. And so with, with PropWire, what we said is we said, well, what if we came out with a software that had all the same data and we made it available to search and download for free? And so that's what we did. We, it's kind of like the Zillow of the data, mm -hmm. the seller data world is kind of how I think about it. 
And, but I, it had to be world-class. It had to have a really amazing UI. So I went out and I, I got some of the best developers I could find, invested millions into the UI and into the data, and we launched this prop wire. And what it is, is it's literally unlimited data that you can search and download for free. We do not charge a subscription to do that. Why would you do such a thing? We need to hire nine salespeople in the next five weeks. We launched our done for you sales service just a month ago and the demand for it has been absolutely crazy. We have all these people reaching out to us saying, our sales service has been so helpful for them. Please get us more salespeople. If you are in high ticket sales or looking to get into that space, if you want a calendar filled up with people raising their hands saying, call me at this time, please sell me. I want to be sold to by a highly experienced salesperson. We are looking for you to have that role. We want to take people who are good and make them great. People who want to be held accountable the same way Michael Jordan would want his coach to hold him accountable, to take him to that next level. So if you want Ian Ross or myself to train you to get better at sales, if you want to be able to control your income, decide exactly how much money you make, and you want to work at a company where you value and appreciate it, we encourage you, click the link below. However, we're only hiring superstars. If you're not A plus caliber, don't click below. Here's why. I'm playing the long game, and this, most people won't really, maybe, maybe some people will grasp this concept, but, I will lose money month over on this project again and again for as long as I can write the check forever, as long as I'm building the user base. Mm -hmm. I want the user base. Mm -hmm. And why would you not, even if you still like your other account that you're paying for, why would you not also have this? It's free. Mm -hmm. So in time, I think I'll have millions of users using the platform. Mm -hmm. Now, you do have to register to set up your free account. Right. So now what am I doing? I'm building this massive list. In less than a year, we have over 100, I think we have 120,000 users in under a year on the system. And so now the real value to me is the users that are using the system. And we've introduced monetization, like we have skip tracing that you now can pay for. Mm -hmm. it, it's 10 cents, not 12 cents, so mm -hmm. it's a better deal. Yeah. And uh, we're doing a really special thing for, for your audience when, we, mm -hmm. when, when you wanna talk about that, where you can get free skip tracing included and it's a really cool thing that we're doing right now, or we want to offer to do right now. Yeah. So really my end game is like, okay, how do I make it amazing? How do I make the data good? How do I make it so that everybody wants this software and mm -hmm. uses this software and build just a massive user base? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds totally insane. It's um, a little crazy. Like I'll either be a genius or a complete idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> One like... of the two. <laughs> Time will uh, tell. Uh, Dan Kennedy is someone I've talked about on the show quite a bit, right? Brilliant, brilliant marketer. Uh -huh. direct, best, the, the godfather of direct response marketing. I know he's not the first, yeah, but I feel like he kind of made it mainstream. Yeah. Um, and, you know, his thing was the guy that can uh, lose, the guy that can pay the least, I'm sorry, the guy that can pay the most for the lead and be profitable will always win. Mm-hmm. And I kind of feel like that's what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. You can pay the most because you're losing money every month. I'm losing money every month. Yeah. You can pay the most to get everyone's data, right? Is that accurate? Yeah. Get all the real estate users. Yeah. Yeah. So get access to all the real estate. And what's great about it too is it's not just like wholesalers, but um, it's anybody looking for seller data. So a lot of real estate agents, appraisers, say, inspectors, inspectors yeah. yeah, all the people that need that that look for real estate data are user. Yeah, the entire ecosystem. Yeah. Right? And I don't know, like, is this going to be limited to only homeowners? I mean, at some point, uh, uh, or real estate, I mean, at some point, like, solar, roofing? We have some of those, yeah. yeah. So we have some people that are in some of those businesses that yeah. so you're talk gonna to get homeowners. All, like, you're going to be this conglomerate of data. Yeah. More or less. And I'm okay to lose money or put all the money back into it to make it better. And Yeah. yeah. I mean, probably sold something for like 150 million or yeah, something. 175 somewhere, million. Somewhere around there, right? Mm -hmm. So there's value in just having the data. Yeah. Is that the long play? Yeah, it's the user base. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and, and that's not there's nothing new there. Like if you think about, you know, Instagram, they they made no money for however long. Yeah. Or Facebook. And and or why did they sell for billions of dollars? Because they had a user base. Yeah. So the user base is in the real is the real value, not in the subscription. Gotcha. Gotcha. Man, that's, that's just this crazy thing about. So if you guys are interested, sellerleadsforfree.com. I still think it's ridiculous. Sellerleadsforfree 
com. So, and what we're doing with that is if you guys go to that seller, what is it? Seller leads for free.com for free.com. We're doing a special promo. If you go to that link, you're going to get for $97 a month. So that is it. We call it gold. It's a subscription model now for $97 a month, but you get 250 free skip traces mm -hmm. with that $97 a month. So if you think about it, that's what $300 a month value Yeah, for $97. Right. Again, why I'm okay to lose money. Mm -hmm. To, to build a strong user base using the platform. But that's only if they want the skip tracing, right? Yeah, so you pay, you well, is the data, everything else is still free. Yeah, all the, all the seller data is free. Everything else is still free, yeah. All the seller's data is free. If you want to skip trace it. You get 250 a month for free. And again, we only charge if the skip trace is successful. So if, right. it's, if you don't get a clear skip trace, then you don't yeah. pay it. So you get 250 uh, free skip traces a month for the $97 a month subscription. Yeah. And you and I were talking about this. And that's for that. You got to go to that, though, to get that. Yeah, sellerleadsforfree.com. And you and I were talking about this. <laughs> They're like, why aren't more influencers talking about this? Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe, I, you know, it's free. So, yeah. So why would someone promote it if they're getting an affiliate commission from? Yeah, I'm getting 50% from PropStream. Why would I? Yeah, why would I promote this? Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing I tell people that have... If, if, if somebody else like you that has an audience has the foresight, um, if you cookie in now or if you if you bank subscriptions now, as we roll out things, you'll mm -hmm. start, because well, we are going to monetize, right? We're going to offer things. Mm -hmm. We already do skip tracing. You know, as things, as the user base grows and we offer, you know, asset protection or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever things are out there, lending. Lending is one of our biggest things on the platform. We're going to offer lending. Yeah. Any one of those users that then monetizes in one of those ancillary products is a commission to you. So gotcha. even though it might not be there today, here's what I tell people. Everybody's going to have an account at some point. <laughs> Why would you not start getting yours now? Right. Because it's going to become, it's going to snowball where it's like, well, why would I not have it? It's free. Exactly. So uh, you're subjecting yourself probably to a fair amount of animosity. <laughs> yeah. So why do this? Um... I don't, it's, it's definitely disrupting the industry. Real I'm definitely making, is the name of the yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, you get it, right? Yeah, like <laughs> disrupt, disruption. I feel like if some, it, this is just how innovation works. Like this is mm -hmm. how technology works. Yeah. If I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. And, and, you know, then they'll be mad at that person. But right. we don't do things just because it might make somebody else obsolete or, right. you know, ruin their model. I just feel like it's, a, it's the opportunity. And I wanted something that was impactful. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you do things, very few things in my life. Everything's like transactional. I do a deal. Great. It's about the deal. This is actually something that I'm really behind that is changing an entire industry. Yeah. So it's kind of fun to be behind something like that. So if I go to the, the URL, right? Sellerleadsforfree.com. Sell leads I go there. I register. What am I getting? So for that, I mean, you can just go to PropWire and do it for free. But if you go to that link there, you'll, you'll, you'll join a subscription for $97. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the 250 free skip traces. We also do a weekly um, small group coaching, like Zoom. Mm -hmm. And you get on there. We show how to do, do different things. We answer questions. So you get that as well. And I give away an entire library of really cool resources as like a bonus. Mm -hmm. So you get all that. And there's two other upgrades that get, I forget what it is, like 5,000 skip traces mm -hmm. and 10,000 skip traces. Gotcha. So the goal there with that, what's the goal there? Why why offer 250, um, or I'm sorry, not 250, 2,500 I might have said that wrong earlier. Mm -hmm. It's 2,500 free skip traces for $97 a month. Mm -hmm. Why? I want to get the active investors that are doing deals and they're spending money on skip tracing and they're doing cold calling and they're doing all the things. I just want them actively on the system. Mm -hmm. So I'll lose money to get active users right. using the skip tracing and using the data. For what purpose? To grow a user base of yeah. active users. Gotcha. Yeah, that's so, the end game. I mean, that's it. You're just going to be this giant data house and i'm yeah and so if if you get an affiliate commission for that and now you're promoting it it'll hopefully help grow the platform yeah well i mean that, that's for me right yeah but i'm talking about for you like the, yeah. pur the overarching purpose because like i said you know i was talking to the, someone a few months ago and it's like man like prop stream revenue or affiliate revenue that like cut in half it's like yeah that sucks yeah right yeah and they're you know they're definitely scared about it right like yeah. it's i'm getting noticed for it mm -hmm. But I honestly feel like we'll have a million, two million, multi-million users on the platform. Yeah. So in what's, time. So what's the vision? Talking about user bases, right? Um, 
industry industry wise. So wholesalers, obviously, right? I mean, yeah. Flipping Master TV, right? You mm -hmm. got like five hundred thousand subscribers. Insane, aspirational. It's more than ten x mine. So you got flippers and wholesalers, realtors eventually, mm -hmm. appraisers, mm -hmm. and then we were saying potentially other home services. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it could be solar or past or anybody that's mm -hmm. that's that's trying to target homeowners. They yeah. would like that data as well. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I we have a lot of people inside the, the the real estate wholesaling flipping world who have now expanded outside mm. and are seeing like holy crap the things we do are innovative because the margins are large um but a lot of, a lot of other industries are still somewhat antiquated i mean i can speak for myself when i went from the realtor world to the wholesaler world like mm. this is a business night and day <laughs> this is like yeah the the assembly line of oh leads right like and the marketing we do, like we're light years ahead of most real estate agents. Like they don't even know how to follow up or like anything. <laughs> yeah. And here we are like legit running legit businesses with wholesale. And what I'm hearing right now uh, from some of my colleagues is like HVAC is like this new thing, mm. right? Solar has been around for some time. And like, I, I kind of felt for some time, like, like our Mormon friends have like cornered that market. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, solar. But, solar. Yeah. Right, yeah. and that's the feeling I get, you yeah. know. And I say this as I'm playing basketball with a lot of Mormon friends. Yeah. Right? Well, the return missionaries—they're used to door to door. Door to door. Yeah. They're the best at it. Yeah. Like, there's no one better qualified to yeah. sell. They did it for two years every day, selling Jesus. Selling you know? Jesus. How hard is that? Yeah. Right. So, uh, but HVAC seems to be the new thing. So, there any any potential there? Like, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all and what and what's great about it is is we're trying to make that user experience really good. Mm -hmm. So I invest a lot in making sure, like my goal with it is you don't need any tutorial to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. It's so intuitive that you can just, oh, okay, here's we're talking how I like do. Steve Jobs level of intuitiveness. Yeah, the, the goal with it is the least amount of clicks possible to mm -hmm. get you to the information you want. Gotcha. And so we do some cool things, like we have a list stacking mm -hmm. where you can, you can actually say, okay, well, I wanna look at, Absentee owners and pre foreclosure, check, check, done. And it gives me that stacked list. Gotcha. You know, so cool things like that, uh, comping feature. One of the coolest things is all the owner information. So you can actually go in and see, like, when did they buy this? What's their, what's their balance on their loans? Mm -hmm. You know, so it gives you all of that data as well. Um, we, we already aggregate real estate agent data. So we have on market data on there too. So mm -hmm. unlike what a lot of the other platforms do, because I come from the background of buying a lot of on market properties. Mm -hmm. What we do is we actually scrape for keywords similar to what Redfin does with their fixer upper feature. Mm -hmm. And we, we now aggregate uh, motivated seller, distressed seller data on the MLS right in the system. So, so can, you can look at on market leads and find distress. So I can, I can see a, a distressed property, see his MLS deal and call the realtor directly. And, and now before you have to dig it up, you know, cause they, they don't make the listing agent very mm -hmm. easy to find usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We gather that and it's right there. So the listing agent's contact info is in there as well. Yeah. So you really, like you're trying to create a one-stop shop. Yeah. 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 You're a pioneer. Um, my biggest fear about being a pioneer, you get all the arrows in your back. Yeah. Right. You got some I'm big taking target. my lumps. <laughs> yeah. I'm taking my lumps and, and you know what? I, maybe it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure putting my heart and soul into it. and Oh, yeah. I mean, that much is clear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, again, like, we've known each other for, for quite some time. It's was, was actually kind of funny to think about it. It's like over, like, six years, right? Yeah. And, and you see this journey and, like, what you've done. Because I remember when I first saw uh, you, when I met you at your house, where it was uh, me, Pace, Brent, Jamil, uh, and a couple other guys. I was like, oh, that's the Flipster guy? <laughs> like, I already downloaded that. I did that trial <laughs> at some point. I checked out Flipster. Oh, you're the Flipster guy. So it's, it's really cool to see yeah. like this evolution from Flipster and you know and getting by the way like trapped in your your email, the vortex. <laughs> yeah, you can't get out. Like you're yeah. in. Like you. <laughs> yeah, you, until you buy something, you're not allowed to get out. You're not allowed to leave, right? <laughs> but to go to experience it on the inside as a consumer and meet you and then see this journey and see like everything you've done, like it, it's it's absolutely remarkable. And then so you're leading. It feels like you're leading the industry in two different fronts. You're leading mm -hmm. it on the the wholesale uh, regulatory, like, hey, everyone, like, this is what's coming. So, which we spent a good, a good part of this show on. Maybe that's not why they clicked on the link, but I think it's really important. Yeah. Right. And the second part was like, I'm gonna give everyone seller information. Right. Here's the stress list. 
if you want to go door knock, if you want to go send mail to it, like here's the list. And if you want to call it, here's the cost, mm -hmm. right? It's pretty remarkable what you're doing here. Thank you. Um, I mean, I was gonna say like anything else you're excited about? I mean, you got a lot going on here. Is there anything? <laughs> yeah, else? I think just, um, we talked about a little bit earlier, but I think the, the evolution of our industry mm -hmm. is um, capital. I think we're gonna, no matter how we slice it, mm -hmm. I love some of these ideas like like the installment method. Like I think that might become now a, a really go-to strategy. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's something there. But I think if people wanna play in this game, it's gonna get back to the good old fashioned, you got you better be able to fund stuff. Mm -hmm. Fund it, buy it, and now do stuff with it. Yeah. So we're, we're actually um, working with some nationwide lending and funding on uh, PropWire where, where it'll be available there where you can go on there and you can do DSCR loans, fix and flip loans, transactional funding, which we already do some of that. And now this new, I don't even know what to call it yet, but it's like the 60-day wholesale money, mm -hmm. but just the quick turn type of lending because that's a little different now. Mm -hmm. And I've got a lot of ideas on how to structure that to where it's a big win for investor, the, the lender and it's also accessible to the everyday person right. at 100%. So like the full purchase funded yeah and to me i that's the clear path that i see the newbie staying in the game and when i say newbie i just mean where uh right now capital is a is a, a huge barrier to entry to yeah. a lot of people and less resourced yeah they have few, you're very have, limited yeah limited resources so if you're, if you're resource limited here's the workaround you got again sell at least for free uh, dot com and then you got Funding, it sounds like it's gonna be available there. Mm -hmm. So that gets you in the game, like right, like now you have all the excuses people make up are like they're not real. Like right. my goal is to remove any excuse why you can't be successful in this business. Man, if you can figure that one out, you know, I mean, you've been in business for some time. Here's here is my continuous frustration: is that people that tell me they want to be successful, and oftentimes I want them to be successful more more than them. they do, <laughs> more than they do. Yeah. Yeah. Have you figured that one out yet? No, I, and I don't think you will. I mean, part of this, if you're in the education space as, as you are, is just understanding the nature of people and the journey they're on. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to be very judgmental about it. Like I used to take it really personally that somebody would come on, maybe they sign up, maybe they spend money on a, on a coaching program, and then I never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. And I used to take that person like, man, somehow I, maybe I failed that person. And certainly there's like, look in the mirror, make sure you're, you're doing right. But um, we have such a high attrition rate because people's intentions never match their, their actual output, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people, they have really great intentions, but then when it, when it comes time to do the work and pick up the freaking phone and mm -hmm. call 100 people today, most people just don't have what it takes to do it. Yeah, my, uh, my crummy joke's always been that most people want to be rich, like I want a six-pack. Like, I don't want they it. They kind of want it. Kind of want it. But not really but gonna, that, not, <laughs> I'm not going to do the work required. <laughs> I can do the yeah. sacrifice to get a six pack, right? It's like, yeah, you want to be rich, but like, you don't want to do the, yeah. the, the work. I, I tell people, I have this challenge I do all the time, Steve, where I say, if you talk to a hundred sellers, like get them on the phone and you talk to them and you make an offer, you have to get to an offer. Like mm -hmm. you can't just be like, Hey, okay, bye. Mm -hmm. You got to say, here's a number and put it in front of them. If you mm -hmm. do that a hundred times, you will get a deal, right? You'll get a deal Yeah. that you wholesale for $10,000 or whatever. Yeah. You'll get a deal. It's impossible. Impossible not it's to. It's because the stars will align. You'll just happen to be in the right place at the right time. But you yeah. got to talk to 100 people. You got you to gotta do the work. But people don't do it. I'm blown away. People don't do it. Yeah. They get to number 29 and they say, this doesn't work. And they can't handle the rejection. And it's painful. And they quit. Yeah. Um, I, I've got this idea. I, I mean, it might come across as judgmental. I had this conversation with my best friend. Um, he's my accountability partner. We've been... Accountability partners, I want to say since 2011. It's like kind of fascinating to look back at. And his, and his wife is a life coach. We're talking like, we push this entrepreneurship message on, on social media, right? Here, I'm guilty of it here, right? We push this message, we push this message. But it really isn't for everybody, right? It's for like 4 or 5% of the population, if that. Everyone wants it when they see the, uh, the rewards. They see the you know, the nice car mm -hmm. or the watch or the vacations, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they don't see like 95% of it that sucks. Yeah. Right. They don't see like having to let someone go 
Mm-hmm. They don't see the accountability conversations. They don't see like having to get a loan. Losing money on a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we'll see that. Do you think there's an entrepreneurial gene? Have you heard that idea? I have not. What's that? Like you're, you're just, you're either born with it or you're not idea. Uh, I mean, I have, I, I, I won't say you're born with it or you're not, but I think that there's a lot of nature in it. A lot of nature and good amount of nurture as well. Yeah. I mean, is there, what have you read on that? I mean, I think there's, they're trying to find some science around that. And mm-hmm. there's some, there's some data. It's more around uh, your risk taking gene. Mm-hmm. Cause that is, a, there's, there's actually, you know, we have a genetic makeup for our ability to tolerate risk. Really? And entrepreneurs obviously have a high tolerance for risk. Yeah. So low toler- low risk tolerance people don't end up don't end up being entrepreneurs. No, you can't. Yeah. And you'll, you just, you'll lose you're your mind. Stressed out. Yeah, you'll be you, stressed out of yeah. your mind. So I think there is something there that um, maybe that kind of lends to that. I think that might be something similar. And, yeah. And I think just being firstborn, I think has a lot of it. Uh, I think uh, are you where are you second second yeah um, because typically not anymore but like. In the past, historically, if you were firstborn, your parents were like 18 or 22, right? Like my dad was 22, my mom was 16. Mm-hmm. Mine too, yeah. Right? Like, did they know what they were doing? Yeah. Right? And so, like, growing up, you had to figure a lot of things out. Uh, like, yeah. And my parents were working 60, 80, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, more 80 than 70, right? Yeah. Like, they weren't around. They were good parents, but they weren't around because they had to hustle. So, growing up in that household, you had to heat up the food yourself. Yeah. If you were hungry. There was no like DoorDash or Grubhub <laughs> or whatever, yeah. right? You had a lot of responsibility for yourself. Uh huh. Take right? care of yourself. Yeah. So I think that part where you were programmed to be resourceful from a young age. Yeah, I do think though. Like sometimes I just meet someone and I'm like, "You got it." Like they just got an internal drive. If there's a dog in them, and they're ready, mm-hmm. and they're hungry, and sometimes they just need the right platform, and they just yeah, they just explode. Right. Yeah. And, and then other people, I, I, I had a, a high ticket coaching student and I was sitting down with them and they said to me, this is what they said to me. They said, Jerry, so here's the deal. I have a really good paying job. And so my family and I, we have a, we have this certain standard of living and I want to make this real estate thing work, but I don't want to jeopardize my current standard of living. How do I do that? <laughs> like that was his question. Mm-hmm. In other words, I don't really want to make any sacrifices, but I want the end result. Right. I want the end result without the sacrifice. And I said, I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, I don't think you can. I mean, you're no. going to have to, when your job ends at five, you're going to start your second job till midnight. Like, yeah. right? Like that's how you get something going. Right. Until that replaces this. Like you, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> you don't, unless you are willing to really pay a price mm-hmm. to have it. How bad do you want it? doesn't sound like you really want it that bad. And he mm-hmm. didn't because he was comfortable. I mean, the biggest, the biggest deterrent to success is comfort. I mean, Jim Collins wrote the book, right? Uh, the enemy of, uh, was it, good is the enemy of great. Yeah. Yeah, right. good to great, right? Yeah. If you've got a good life, it's pretty if you're hard comfortable, to get a pursue oh, great life. That's right. The reason why I love wholesale and the reason why I'm so frustrated with all the, the, the uh, regulations and so on is that all the people that aren't living good lives, we're removing this path for them. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so guys, again, if you guys are interested, sellerleadsforfree.com, get access to Jerry's insane program. I, I, I hope, you know, he, 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 he doesn't disappear. Someone doesn't, <laughs> someone doesn't. I get know. in a mysterious car accident or something. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have, <laughs> hope you don't have something bad happen to you. Uh, you'll pick up the phone whenever I call you still. Um, so sellerleadsforfree.com, what are some last thoughts and messages you want to leave all the listeners with? Yeah, I just think, guys, be nimble, be willing to adapt quickly. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, the most successful people in this business, they're quick to adapt. You know, I was, I met earlier with uh, Zach Keeps mm-hmm. and I mean, the guy's a machine and, and he was telling me, he's like, yeah, I had a house burned down today. I'm like, what, wait, what? And he was just casual about it. I'm like, wait a minute. Did you just say you're, you had a, one of your, pro- and he owns like a ton of property. You had yeah, he one of, he's like, yeah. I'm like, are you, are you like freaked out about that? He's like, nah, man, like I got insurance. I got this. It's all right. And so like his level of ability to adapt to things that happen is so high. Mm-hmm. And everybody I see that, that operates at a high level, they're just, they're just quick to adjust. Mm-hmm. And the more able you're willing to do that and, are, and, are, and, it, and embrace it, like not, don't, not just like tolerate it, but embrace it. So for me, it's like, hey, if I can do something disruptive or if I can take all this negative regulation stuff, there's a door closing, what's the door opening? 
even if I've got to, I've got to go create a door to mm -hmm. open, right? Like what's the opening door and how do I be first to implement? The early implementers are the ones that make the money. Oh yeah. hundred percent. You know, like how do you be an early implementer and, and get your head out of, like, take the blinders off. I mean, I see so many people with blinders on mm -hmm. in our business and just in, in general where they're just so hyper-focused on like this one way of doing something that they miss all this other opportunity. Yeah. And I think if there's one thing I could share about what we talked about today was just like, guys, don't, if you're thinking right now, ah, well, wholesaling's too hard, I'm out. Man, if that's all it took was a friction, like a little bit of friction and you're out, then you should have never been here in the first place because you're right. never going to make it. All right. Because there's a lot of friction to do this business well. Yeah, it reminds me of a quote from Elon Musk. It's like, what do you tell an entrepreneur uh, that is going through hard times? It's like, if this is what breaks you, you never should have been an entrepreneur. It's like, dang. Yeah. Yeah. How can someone find you? Uh, I mean, I, my biggest thing is YouTube. Like that's where I try to spend most of my time and energy is creating content there. So it's Flipping Mastery. Yep. And mm -hmm. Flipping Mastery is also Instagram and Facebook and stuff. But yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's the best way. Man, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing what's going on. I wish there were more people talking about it. But I mean, the fact that you are going deep into this and sharing updates as to what's going on. You're like a reporter on the street. It, it's, <laughs> it's incredible value for everyone that's, that's, you know, interested. It's affecting their career. So Flipping Mastery, definitely guys, check it out on YouTube. Thank you so, for, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next time. Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We real estate disruptors.